And join me in standing as we begin singing praises under our Savior this morning. Turn to your hymnals 140, number 140 as we sing. He lives, he lives within my heart. 140 in your hymnals as we sing all three verses this morning. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. Walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the Great start this morning. Turn over to number 628 in your hymnals. 628 as we sing, My Savior's love. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. All five verses, number 628. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Savior's love for me. 
Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to witness thy power this morning with blessing us, for bl uh, blessing us with this beautiful Sunday morning. Only thy power can create such, such a beauty. Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us this morning to gather together and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for being our Lord and our Savior. Lord, I continue to pray for this nation, Lord. Lord, no matter what trials we go through, I know, Lord, that as we glorify thy name, you will always shield us from any temptation or harm. We pray for this pandemic issue, uh, situation, Lord, that you will con to continue to keep us healthy, Lord, and uh, protect us from any temptation and discouragement, Father. Lord, I know your word is true, Lord, so I pray, Lord, as uh, I thank you, Lord, for sending pastor, and I pray that as he share us with your words, which we know is always true, Lord, that we'll that our hearts will be like a sponge, Lord, with absorb it, Lord, and also not only that, Lord, but to be obedient to it, Father, that we will do a life, a little life that will glorify thy name. Father, thank you, Lord, most of all, for your love to us, Lord, that no matter how evil we have done this, you have always had the infinite mercy to forgive us, Father. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your words as pastors share, your, share, share us your word. These ask and pray in your son's name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and remain standing. Take your hymnals. Turn to number 348 in your hymnals. 348 as we continue singing praises. My hope is in the Lord. Number 348. We'll sing all four verses. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord.
Amen. One last hymn this morning, number 596 in your hymnals. Number 596, as we sing victory in Jesus. Aren't you grateful for the victory we have through our Savior? 596, as we sing all three verses this morning. I heard an old, old story. some notes right towards the end on that last verse I heard about a mansion I heard about a mansion before the message this morning. We're going to have a special of a little different type. If you want the words, take your hymn books, 491, and uh, Ruthie's going to play on the flute. And so just listen to uh, the melody there and let the words of the song, if you want to review those, uh, 491 in your hymn books, and uh, let the words speak to your heart.
Amen. Beautiful song, and sometimes it does us good just to listen to the music and let it speak to us. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke, I mean, Luke chapter 8, I'm sorry, verse 18. Three times in the scripture, Jesus gives this plea, and uh, sometimes, as we have recorded on many occasions, Jesus does things, says things in a certain way to arrest our attention, to make us stop and think, uh, to actually put a glitch in the thought process, we might say, uh, to catch those that are trying to find truth in the void or the emptiness in which they really lived and help them understand that truth is not always just what we think it is. And uh, we're just going to read uh, verse 18 here of the book of Luke in chapter 8 and then dive in. It says, Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. In Luke chapter 19, we have the parable of the pounds and verse 26, Jesus says, For I say unto you that everyone which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from you. In the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, for unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And so as we read these verses, look at these statements that Jesus met, made, the first question we might ask is, is that fair? Uh, I mean, uh, if you've been around our church uh, very long, uh, you know that I have a, a few things that I like to uh, just return to often. And one is this false notion, this lie of fairness. Uh, we have what we call the fairness doctrine that kind of permeates every part of our uh, society today. And I, I want you to know that uh, as I often refer when talking about this, if Bill Gates can figure it out, why can't you? Uh, life is not fair is his first rule. Uh, I don't know the rest of them. I don't care what the rest of them are. Not even Bill Gates is wrong about everything, just most everything. And uh, we, we get this idea that why would God take or give to the rich, give to the people that have things, make the rich richer, and, and the poor, he's going to take away even that which they seem to have. Uh, when is the last time you heard about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? Uh, probably yesterday, if you're listening to the news, or this morning. I mean, uh, that seems to be the uh, clarion call of our day that we need to make it fair for everyone and yet if we'll read what Jesus says kind of goes against that now doesn't it now we do need to understand that first of all no understanding of any scripture contradicts another scripture And yet we, we have this idea that everything ought to be equal and we ought to uh, distribute fairly to everyone and that is the Christian way. But let me ask you a question. When is the last time that happened? I, I'll tell you when it was. It was when you were in school and two or three people were misbehaving and the teacher reached the frustration level and she punished the whole class, or he did. How many of you remember that happening? Uh, that's the last time that you probably 
enjoyed, uh, and I promise you probably didn't enjoy it. I'm being a little sarcastic here. Please forgive me. But the fairness doctrine, because... There is no such thing. It's one of the devil's lies. And as we're looking here, we're in this passage, as we explore this statement that Jesus made, we're going to understand something. Riches are not evil. And poorness is not good. One of the statements people love to quote out of the Bible, it's better to give than to receive. Normally, uh, that statement comes from somebody wanting something. Uh, I've, I've had that used on me. Well, you're the pastor of the church. It's better to give than to receive. And normally, the next thing that I say unto them is, uh, something along these lines, but I'm not going to pay for your liquor and your cigarettes. Uh, that's not what that verse is talking about. And uh, sometimes they'll get very mad. And, and uh, the reason it's better to give than to receive is because if you're giving something, that means you have to have something to give first. One of our problems is today, we try to take nothing and give it to somebody and pretend that it's something. Uh, we call that psychology and, and counseling. Most of the time is somebody who has nothing trying to give you nothing and package it up as something so you can feel better about the nothing. But when you go home, guess what? You still have nothing. If somebody's gonna give you something, they have to have something to give you. And so as we look at this, and I, I do want to call into uh, uh, memory that God is no respecter of persons. God does not treat any one person uh, specifically in a special way just because he wants to and punish others. Uh, we're, we're not Calvinists here. Uh, and we're not going to seek to understand what Jesus said simply through the reasoning of men. So as we look at this statement, yeah, it goes right against the fairness doctrine. But it doesn't contradict, it cannot contradict what the Bible teaches about that God is no respecter of persons, that he's not going to treat one person differently than another. But God does believe in rewarding those that are obedient to him. He believes in giving the best that he has to those who will come to him his way. Amen. Uh, the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that is part of the understanding of this passage if we're not careful, but we do need to bring this in. There's a lot of people who think they deserve more than they're getting. Now, how many of you remember the parable that Jesus gave of the men going to work in the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard goes out to the marketplace and he finds laborers and he agrees with them for the statutory rate of a penny a day. You say, that's ridiculous. Uh, well, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, my grandfather worked in the mines for a dollar a day and that was very good pay. Now we get $100 a day and it's nothing. Uh, but just putting it all in perspective, at the end of the day, he had gone out at several different times and found different 
groups of men in the marketplace. Finally, he goes out one hour before quitting time, one hour before sundown, and he finds the last group of people and he brings them out. And when it comes time to pass out the pay, guess who gets paid first? The guys that only worked one hour. You know what they get paid? A full day's wage. Is that fair? Well, you have to understand something. In those days, a day's wage paid for food for your family for a day. And so the owner of Jesus' story was providing food for the families of those people that had worked for them for the day, even though they'd only worked one hour. No, that's not fair. But I'll tell you what, it's good now, isn't it? And Jesus was trying to teach the truth there. Salvation is not something that we earn. It's given to us as a free gift of God. And yet there are people, if we're not careful, we would not be satisfied with salvation. We would think that God should give us more. And we come down to the end of this first point that we're trying to make here is we have to understand something. There is only one just judge in the entire universe. And who is that? It is the God of this book called the Bible. Can we say amen to that? And so he is the one that has the right to set the standards. He is the one that has the right to tell us what is true and what isn't. And we do not have the right to gainsay him or evaluate his statements for fairness or whether they match our understanding of what things are because he is God. We have the obligation, if we're going to follow God, to let God set the standards. Could we say amen to that? But, but that doesn't make sense. I mean, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the problem of the day is the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. And of course, most of us are among the poor. That's not very good. Uh, well, wait a minute. We have to understand that what is the half in this story? So let's go back to Luke chapter 8 and verse 18. And let's look at what it says here. Take heed, therefore, how ye, what's that next word? How ye hear. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he seemeth to have. So whatever this object is that the person has or hath, as that uh, old English tense is there, Whatever it is that they have comes from hearing. Uh-oh, now that should be one of those little triggers. How many are already with me? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now let's see if that connection fits into the passage here. And make sure we're understanding this correct. Let's go back to the context. And uh, we uh, come down here to verse uh, 4. And it says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every place, he spake by a parable. Oh, so Jesus was teaching here. And at the end of that parable... He gives this little summary starting in verse 16. 
No man when he hath lighted a candle covereth it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick that they which enter in may see the light for nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed therefore how you hear. Now, what did they just heard? The parable of the sower. And so let's take just a few minutes here and make sure we get this parable in the context. And the parable is uh, verse uh, 11. Jesus is going to begin explaining it to them. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So the sower went forth to sow. He sowed on four different types of soil. He got four different types of response. Uh, the disciples in verse 9 say, what does this mean? Jesus said, listen, there are people out there that I am teaching that are not ever going to understand a word that I say. There are people that I am teaching that are going to get it. And I like to remind you when we talk about the parable that Jesus is the sole executor of this literary form, that Jesus alone is able with one speech to reach out to the people that have the truth or want the truth and draw them closer and give them understanding. At the very same time, he uses the very same words to twist the minds of those that refuse to believe him and push them farther away. That this was something that Jesus did and it was basically miraculous in its work. And so he says the word, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, there's the word again, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection." But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, Jesus is warning the disciples here. I want you to take heed how you hear the word of God, because those that have are going to be given unto and those that have not are going to lose even that they think they have. Now, that's a fairly sobering thought. You see, what they have, the object of the verb hath, is faith. If you have faith in God, I want to challenge you to think about this. Can you describe the salvation that God gives to anyone who will come to him by faith and believe it? Say, well, uh, yeah, I mean, you're born into God's family. Stop right there for a minute. I am born into God. God's family, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. As we're going through the book of Hebrews, we're going to start on chapter two, a week from this Thursday. This Thursday, Brother Franz will be preaching. Uh, and so do encourage you to be here Thursday night to uh, hear his message. But it says that Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, can somebody put a value on being accepted into God's family? 
being written into the will of God, joint heirs with all things with Jesus Christ. The fact that if Jesus Christ were standing here today, in spite of our sins and our failures and our shortcomings to God, in spite of who we are and what we are, that he put his arm around us and say, this is my brother, this is my sister. These are my people. I identify with them. That'd be uh, what, what would we say? I'll tell you what we'll say. Same thing the prodigal son said when the father grabbed him and kissed him and drug him into the house. Nothing. Because there's nothing left to say. You talk about having and being given to in abundance. And that's just one aspect of our relationship with God. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's what the half is because you get it by hearing, amen? And that hearing comes from the word of God and Jesus is warning these people, listen, God's means of uh, remuneration, God's levels of reward are not the same as man. If you have faith in God, if you have these things, the rewards of faith are beyond our imagination and comprehension. And yet, maybe I could illustrate it this way. And this is a joke, so pretend not for real. But uh, let's say that uh, some benefactor had come in and said, everybody that attends church, I want to give them a, uh, uh, a bank wad of $100 bills. And I told you, under your seat is that. You're only allowed one, but uh, if you're in here and you're sitting, every person gets one. And somebody picked up their seat, stood up, picked up their seat and saw it. I'll bet there'd be a whoop. Whoa! Hey, look, it's real. And everybody be throwing seat pads in the air and flipping through the money and, and going, ah, and it's only money. In fact, our money is worth less today than it has ever been in history. And yet, this is church, and we're talking about faith in God and the fact that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call me his brother, call you his brother or sister. I know that preacher. Yeah. So? I'll tell you one second into eternity that will mean more to you than could ever be put into words that could be described as the culmination, the uh, uh, taking every joyous and good thing in your life, putting it all in the same pot. And you go, that's nothing to knowing Jesus. And yet that's just one little aspect of faith in God. That's just one little part of the relationship. Do you, are, are you starting to peel back the veneer and, and see what it means to be he that hath is going to be given so that they can have it in abundance? It says that it is his good pleasure to give to us the kingdom. Now we have to be very careful about that kingdom. There's a lot of people running around talking 
uh, about the kingdom, I will tell you this one thing, when the kingdom is here, it's not going to be about you. It's going to be about the king. That's going to be Jesus. But we get to have a part in that. I mean, how do we illustrate this? How many of you have had your life uh, affected negatively by decisions made by our governing people or bodies. I mean, how many of you have had negative things happen in your life because of the mayor and the governor and the uh, president and uh, Congress and all of these things? Every one of us in this room. And yet, Stop and think of what's going on in countries where the government is corrupt, totalitarian. I mean, we, we have no idea. Uh, there's some pretty good guesses as to why the number of uh, COVID-19 cases are so low in China. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is there's been a lot of people that have died of other causes before the Wuhan virus had a chance to do it. I mean, that's just the way uh, that these totalitarian tyrants work. And those that have lived under the Soviet Iron Curtain knows that, that hey, when you ran afoul of the government, you just disappeared. It was no big deal. That was the way things worked in those days. Things could get a lot worse than they are. but I want you to think about the kingdom of God for a minute. There will not be one, uh, what word do we use? The word stupid is very crude. It really describes what's happening. That is ignorance on purpose. Uh, but it's, it's a harsh word, but do you realize there will not be one decision for a thousand years in the kingdom of Christ that is made out of ignorance or ill will toward any group of people? I mean, st stop and think about that for a minute. Not one decision will be made by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as he rules this earth for a thousand years that is based on corruption, avarice, or ignorance because Jesus isn't capable of doing that. And guess who his officers are going to be? That's going to be those that have faith. You see, that's another aspect of this faith thing. You know, the biggest lie that we face today is people say, well, communism would work if we only had the right people. I read an article a couple years ago that said, you know, if Stalin only had modern technology, he could have been such a good ruler. I'm sitting, where, where in the world does that thought process come from? I mean, without the technology, Stalin managed to kill somewhere around 20 million Russians, uh, I think, pretty much. Most people living in Ukraine and uh, who knows how many tens of thousands, if not millions of other people who opposed him in any way. I mean, this guy was uh, uh, the largest mass murderer in modern human history. And we have someone claiming that if he'd only had better technology, he could have been kinder. Wow. Does that give you kind of a hint what the other half of this passage means? That he which hath not, even that which he seemeth to have, is going to be taken away? You see, you can't oppose God. Can we say amen to that? And the half is faith. If you have 
faith, God is going to add to your faith. Guess what God adds to faith? Read James chapter 2. A living faith must produce living what? Works. Right? Living faith produces living works. That's what the book of James is all about. And what happens with works? Uh, they get judged. You see, if you have works and you present those works to God in hopes that you will be good enough or have enough to get to heaven, God's going to say, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't even get a start. Yeah, the, no matter how many works you get, that doesn't get you one second in heaven. And you lose everything, even that you think you have. But if you have faith as a basis of those works, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive rewards for those works. But let's go back. Now, where did faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith is, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Amen. It is the gift of God. God gives us faith. When we respond to that faith by believing in him and trusting only in Jesus Christ, it opens a door for God to give us salvation. When we take that saving faith and give it back to God, it allows us to live for him in this day and time by his power, by his grace, by his goodness. And God is going to reward us for that. And what do we get to do with the rewards? How many of you read the book of Revelation? Those mighty beasts that surround the throne of God are going to cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He that was and is and forevermore. And all the angels of God are going to fall down and worship him. And those that have received those rewards are going to cast those crowns or rewards at the feet of him that sits upon the throne. We, we haven't talked a lot about worship lately. But most of the time when we talk about worship, you have one of two responses. Or... Let's get out the rock band and really get to it. And I want to tell you, both responses are blasphemous. To say that worshiping the God of heaven is boring means you have no idea who God is. Just none at all. No clue. I mean, uh, the saying is, Oh, they're not even in the ballpark. Well, you haven't made the parking lot. Uh, you, you just, you're not even on the highway that leads to the stadium here. You are so far off that uh, there, there's really no hope of helping you if you think worshiping God is boring. But on the other extreme, if you think you know, need to go to the garbage cans of the world to dish up something that will please and honor God, uh, I, I'd say you're just about as misguided as the first group. And that's what it means when it says, whosoever hath not, oh, I'm not saying it exactly correct. Let me just read it out of my notes here. And whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. I want us to understand something. 
we, we need to take heed to how we hear. One of the hardest things for me as a preacher to deal with is people will come week after week and month after month and they're not saved. And they won't get saved. And I don't know what to do. Or people that will say, well, I'm saved, but I'm not going to get baptized. I'm not going to join church. I'm not going to do these. Faith Real faith ought to make a difference in the way that we live. It ought to make us want to live differently. If it doesn't, and it brings us to the motivation of faith. We love him because he first loved us. Can you imagine holding in your person the love of Almighty God? And yet there are those they would say, big deal. I don't want love. I want to pay my bills. I just want a happy life. I, all I'm trying to do is get through life. Well, I want to challenge you. If that's where you are, not only do you have nothing right now, but you're going to lose everything when you stand before God. You see, if you have no faith, then there is no salvation. And Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul? If you owned everything, if you made Bill Gates look like a pauper in the street, not to pick on Bill Gates today, but but you have no faith. You're going to lose everything, even your own soul. There is eternal life and there is eternal death. And you do have to make a choice. But if there's no faith, there's no salvation. If there's no faith, there are no service, real service, service that counts because the works that are done are not done out of a motivation of love for Almighty God because you have received His love. Those works are done trying to earn something. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just at a total loss for words to try to describe how offensive to God it is when we, his created beings, disregard everything in this book called the Bible and do things saying, here, God, I want you to be pleased with me. How, how do you put that kind of offense in words? You can't. And what makes it all the more offensive is the fact that God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins and all we have to do is believe in Jesus to get faith. When God has done so much and asked so little and gives so much in return. We, we need to take heed how we hear. We need to make sure, because there's a lot of things we can't do. 
You know what? I don't think there's a one of us in this auditorium. If you've been hiding it, let me know. But uh, I don't think there's a person in this auditorium when things go on at Congress, somebody is calling you saying, now, hey, hey, uh, Sean, what, what, how should I handle this matter here? Not happening, is it? No. Nobody's calling me. In fact, we, we try, you know, we, you look at life and, and our society today and what we call the church that used to be very influential in society and its decisions has now been totally marginalized. In, in fact, our governor has deemed church non-essential. How many are for a resolution to deem our governor non-essential? Uh, I, I don't know that that would, uh, I, I think we'd benefit from that one, uh, but we don't have that authority. Nobody cares. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Let's go back. Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. It says in Matthew, he'll have in abundance. And whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. You know, as we live in this day of injustice, unfairness, whatever other term you want to throw in there, it's easy for the Bible-believing Christian to get discouraged and believe what they say. The rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. When we're talking about faith, that's God's plan. I was reading through a commentary and he said, now reason would, would tell us that certainly as the uh, owner of the vineyard, the person making the payment, uh, would take account of his servants, talking about the parable in Luke and the one in Matthew, that he would give more responsibility to the most productive servant. And you know, that's human reasoning. And, and you know what? It makes sense. But it doesn't work because it violates every principle of faith. You see, where does faith come from? by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So faith cometh from God and all he wants you and I to do is to have that faith, is to grasp that faith, is to believe that when Jesus said it is finished, he meant what he said and he had done the work of salvation. For all false religion, that's the goalpost. And they never get there. But for true faith in Christ, that's the beginning point, my friend. That's where it all starts the best things in my life are because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't earn a one of them. I remember a preacher coming up to me one time and he says, uh, it was before I was married and he says, you know, you're marrying above your head. And I said, oh yeah, I do. Absolutely. And they're not going to get any arguments about that. He thought he was going to yank my chain just a little bit. I, I, I said, God does a whole lot better job than I ever could. In fact, if it weren't for the Lord, I don't think Brother Marshall would ever let go of his daughter in, in the first place. And, and we praise the Lord. Every good thing. You're sitting in a building that God paid for. You talk about Brother Franz's rental situation there at Morris Park. It's unbelievable. 
And how about all the miracles at Union Baptist Church? I'm still hurting from some of those miracles. It took a lot of work. And we just closed last week, Community Baptist, week, two weeks ago now. And guess what? We only owe $7,000. That's not even three months rent. You know, God has a way of giving. More than we could imagine. The fact that we're able to assemble here together as a church. The fact that we can kind of reach out and hold on to each other during this time. How many of you would say, I'm just thankful for what I have at church. It's helped me through this crazy time. We say amen to that. But the church is not ours. It's a gift that God has given us and we get to participate in it. And the more you participate, guess what? The more blessings you get. And then when you get to heaven, you get rewarded for it. I mean, talk about abundance and then get to have part in the kingdom and get to serve God and rule and reign on this earth and show all of these Oh, you're not going to show the politicians because they're not going to be there. But anyway, um, uh, the, the truth of the matter is we get to have a part in the golden age of all earth. And when that's over, talked about this Thursday night, Jesus is going to just fold up this universe like you would an old worn out dish, uh, tablecloth. That's the last time we're ever going to use that. He's going to put it away. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where there's never been one sin and never will be one sin. Just stop and think about that. How beautiful this earth in which we live is. How wonderful this universe in which our little planet spins around. And when he makes it all brand new, whew, talk about abundance. But the greatest is the fact that Jesus claims all who will believe on him. Most of us really don't know what it means to belong. Most of us have been on the outside of things. Even when we get on the inside, we're really not on the inside. I mean, if you want to know one of the reasons I love Heartland Baptist Bible College is they believe what I believe. I haven't had to change them and they don't have to change me and we can work together and I, I, I I'm, have fellowship with other pastors. I get to, I actually a part of something. I can't be a part of the college I went to because they changed all their doctrines. Most of us know what it means to be rejected by friends and family because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're certainly not part of mainstream society in New York City now, are we? And by the way, who would want to be? Because you're going to lose it all. And then you're really going to lose it all. So you take that statement and on the outside, it looks like God's not being fair, that Jesus is saying, hey, But you have to remember, this giving is not about the person that's receiving. It's all about the Savior. Because everything that they had, the guy that took 10 talents and made 10 more out of them, where did he get the 10 talents to start with? 
you know, this is what it means to surrender ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, to just give up, to understand that even when things don't make sense to me, God is in charge and God can never be anything less than good. And it's time for us to stop worrying about ourselves, worrying about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And start being concerned with what Jesus has done for us. You see, love is the true motivation of the Christian life. And when we give ourselves wholeheartedly, when we surrender to his love, we'll find out that God is a far greater giver than we could ever be a receiver. But if you're on the other end of that thing and you're still trying to please God and you're still trying to make God work in your favor and take care of things for you, feel very sorry for you because even that which you think you have you've already lost it you just don't know it yet but if we will just give everything to God you can't outgive him So let's read our verse one more time and then we're done. Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Let's ask the Holy Spirit of God to do work in our hearts today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Lord, passage that most often is just skipped over, talked around. Yet, Lord, I pray that this sermon helped us understand just a little bit to, to gain the truth of what this means. And, Lord, that each of us would endeavor to live, that we would surrender ourselves to you. Lord, that we would worship you in the way that you deserve to be worshiped. And that we would live for you because of love. Lord, I pray that everyone in this auditorium, everyone hearing my voice, even those watching the video, would be on the receiving side of this. That they would be the ones that have faith and that they would be given and given in abundance. And Lord, when we're tempted to take something for ourselves, when we're tempted not to just simply believe in God or even accuse God of being unfair or unjust, we would see how foolish, wicked those notions are. Lord, that we would live for you by faith, that we would take heed how we hear, and we would let what we hear change the way we live. May the Holy Spirit work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as Leland comes and leads us in the hymn of invitation. If you want to come and pray at the altar, we're not going to stop you from doing that. If you want to pray at your seat, you're more than welcome to. But let's make decisions for the Lord this morning. Let's give him what is his due. As we sing, would you make those decisions this morning?
God's people said, Amen. And well, if you want to participate in the offering today, the offering uh, plates are up here on the platform. We have spread them out to maintain social distancing in uh, order to uh, keep all of those things. Uh, don't forget our prayer meeting tonight. Brother Franz will be preaching uh, Thursday night. And uh, our, our family, we're going to try to just get away a couple of days, go camping and see what happens there. Maybe uh, get a little refreshed, one would hope. And so appreciate your prayers there. Um, uh, we should be back. If you want to go to the men's advance in New Hampshire, uh, I need to have your name on the list today. If I've talked to you personally then uh, I have you on the list. Uh, if you are not sure, please see me today because the deposit's got to go out tomorrow before we leave and uh, want to make sure uh, that we're doing all of those things. And so uh, let's greet one another in the name of the Lord and rejoice with him. And so Leland, come lead us as we're dismissed. 51 if you need the words take the name of jesus with you child of sorrow and of woe it will joy and comfort give you take it then where you go precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven precious name Just